Hey, welcome to High Resolution. My name is Bobby Goshal. And I'm Jared Arandu. We're speaking to 25 masters of the design industry. We're still in New York. We're still having the time of our lives. Thank you for joining us again. Jared, who are we speaking to today? We're speaking with Scott Belsky. Scott is the founder of Behance. He's going to tell us how to maximize our creative output, how to use constraints to boost your creativity, and the patterns he's seen in the top design companies. I can't wait to watch this episode, but stick around. Right after this partner message, we're going to get to it. Thanks to Squarespace for their support. Whether you need a domain, a website, or an online store, make your next move with Squarespace. Visit squarespace.com and enter the code HIGHRESOLUTION, one word, for 10% off your first purchase. Scott, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right. What's one thing about design that's clear to you that you don't feel is as clear to other people? It's hard to pick one thing. Um, I think that a few things have become clear to me. First of all, design is very much the little things that make a big difference. I think that little things tend to be overridden in big corporations and, uh, and sometimes deprioritized in small new teams. And yet some of these little things, like whether it's the aesthetic in the in, in, in some part of the user experience of a product, whether it's the decision to professionally photograph um, you know, apartments for Airbnb, whether it's all of these little decisions that end up making a big difference. I think it's one thing that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs that I meet with um, say, oh yeah, that, we'll get to that, but they don't prioritize it. I think the other thing that, um, that companies later on forget is that you know, while, the, um, while the science of, uh, of scaling um, a, a business, you know, is is uh, is really like the core, you know, um, business type of um, uh, uh, practices. Um, you know, the uh, the the art of scaling a business, you know, is very much design. It's 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 non-scalable things. It's interactions with people. It's making the experience um, uh, actually designed. You know, in a way that's consistent from start to finish. Um, I think that's another thing that's that's. That, that tends to be forgotten. And the last thing I would just say, even though you asked me for one thing, is that, um, that design is not only something that's customer facing. People build tools deeply influenced by the tools that they use to build tools. And so designing your internal systems, the tools that you use, the business plan, making it more accessible and using principles of design and marketing to help people engage with the business strategy is critical to get people aligned. What are some of these principles of design? I think it's helping people visibly see progress as it's happening, rather than just cutting it out of the plan because it already happened. Yeah. I mean, you have to feel progress in order to make more progress. Yeah. I think a big part of it is merchandising. Mm -hmm. The actual plan, the what's actionable next stuff needs to be merchandised to people. And how do you merchandise? With design, mm -hmm. um, with great copy, with um, less is more with uh, models uh, not, that are translated into graphics. Mm -hmm. and, and these are just things that we'll do and we'll spend time on for our customers and our marketing campaigns and maybe our boards. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to internal, it's like, oh, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It matters a lot. And, uh, and not only does it matter to help people get aligned, but, but it also helps yourself. Mm -hmm. And as an entrepreneur, I would always help translate using Illustrator, you know, our business plan to something really simple and, and graphically um, illustrated in a way that helped me also understand it. So you once said that great founders are mission centric. Right, let's go back into your history. The last 10 or so years yeah. have been Behance and you're famous for having built a platform to help creatives show their work and actually show finished work to the world. You then wrote a book. Uh, making ideas happen, which inspired me to start my own startup. I told you that before we before right. we spoke yeah. for the first time. And then um, your new project, which is the journey in between, uh, is also about maximizing creative output, maximizing the potential in between in the harder parts of the project plateau. Yeah. Right. What? There's there's a thread here. Uh -huh. There's a there's a common thread I can pull. What is that thread? Well, um, I would say a couple things. You know, first of all, when I when I say that. You know, our business and I have always been mission centric. Yeah. And uh, what I'm also implying is that I'm also medium agnostic mm. in the sense that if there's something I really 
am passionate about and I feel is a problem worth solving mm -hmm. and also is paired with empathy of the people that are actually suffering from that problem. In this case with Behance, it was the disorganization of the creative world mm -hmm. and the fact that there was no attribution, no one knew who did what. Yeah. The, the solution to that, I felt, should be medium agnostic, yeah. meaning it should be a network, uh, technology, potentially a book. We also had a conference that is now in its ninth season, the NNU conference, and a, a series of paper products for organization. I mean, it, it sort of seems crazy from an investor perspective for a company mm -hmm. to be so, quote unquote, all over the place, yet in every instance, the mission of all of these things was the same, to yeah. organize creative people. Yeah. Looking back on it, I think that that was a long game that really could have killed us many times in the short term. Because when you're spreading yourself too thin, uh, it, it introduces risk. It, it splits uh, the energy of the team into different places. Um, if you can somehow pull it off, you end up having a more holistic brand that is really about a mission mm -hmm. rather than a particular medium. And so all of your competitors that are medium-centric, like I'm a technology company or yeah. I'm, a, I'm a kind of prince company, you know, they can't compete with you. Yeah. You're running circles around them with your brand and with the experience, the 360-degree experience you deliver to customers. So I think there's one thread, which is that when I really am committed to solving a problem, I try not to be confined by a particular medium. Sure. Uh, and this new project you referred to um, that I'm currently calling The Journey In Between is really just an effort to better understand and chronicle what great artists or entrepreneurs or even leaders of big companies mm -hmm. do to endure the middle of their journey, the messy middle that no one wants to write about, yeah. no one wants to talk about, the press ignores, is full of anonymity and self-doubt and ambiguity. And it's so fascinating to me how some of those journeys fail and others you know, succeed and what's done in the middle that we can learn from. Yeah, there is definitely a gap between someone's creative potential and like their actual output. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting that you kind of touched on that, that like, you know, that trough or that space yeah. in between like the idea and actually putting something out there. Or most things there. die. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. But what are, the, what are some of the things that you've seen people do to actually get through that stage? Well, what you can do <clears throat> is you can't believe that your incredible vision for what you might actually achieve at the end is enough to keep you motivated. Mm. I think that's a myth that, oh, you know, I, I can imagine where we'll be in years from now and that's, gonna, that's what's gonna keep me going. It may get you started. It may help you at times. But the truth is, is that we are all hardwired for short-term rewards. Um, I remember one of the quotes shared by Fred Wilson, one of our investors at Behance in one of our first 99U conferences, where he said that the two greatest addictions in life are heroin and a weekly salary. Um. It's like so hard to unplug yourself. We are born with this desire for short-term rewards from our parents in the form of love and gratification. And then we get a check on the test in grade school, and then we get a grade in the course, and then we get a weekly salary and potentially a bonus at the end of the year. And then suddenly you unplug yourself from that when you choose to pursue an independent career as a freelancer, or when you choose to be an entrepreneur or start a band or anything else that takes years in order to bring to fruition. And you, you can't rely without those short-term rewards. And when you're not getting them, the question is, what do you do to survive that trough? You have to hack yourself. You have to hack your own reward system. You have to find ways to keep yourself and your team engaged. How do you do that? All kinds of fun things. Some of it's design, putting things around you, celebrating milestones that you basically made up. I mean, one of our things that I like to tell a story about at Behance was, every time you typed in Behance into Google, it always said, do you mean Enhance? Do you mean enhance? <laughs> and so we were always a mistake. Yeah. And so one of the things I would tell my team in the early days was eventually if we get enough Behance users to make profiles and projects and we post enough blog posts and we get enough link backs through all the hustle we're doing to network around the web, we will no longer be a mistake. Google will think we're real. And inevitably, like a year later, suddenly Behance came up when you typed it in. Yeah. And then I think it was a year after that where Beyonce became popular, and suddenly <laughs> you're a mistake again. But it was That's just awesome. little hacks like that yeah. that make all the difference. You've written quite a bit about this. What role do constraints play in the creative process? So I should, I should really start um, that answer with the, um, the question that I would ask a lot of the designers that I interviewed when I was already making ideas happen. I would oftentimes go to very productive, prolific designers, and I would ask them for their, a story around their nightmare brief. Like, when did things go horribly wrong? Yeah. And more often than not, 
um, the stories would start with a open brief that they got from a particular client where the client said, listen, big picture, don't even think about budget. And don't even think about timeline yet, just like big picture. Mm -hmm. And that those routinely were the stories where it was a insufferable process to figure out where to go, which illustrates the importance of, importance of constraints. Constraints unearth our inner sense of resourcefulness, which is much more important than resources. Mm -hmm. Resourcefulness is, um, is making use of what's in front of you, of anchoring yourself with things around you, the constraints, whether it's the timeline or some idea that someone else shared. I just don't think that creatives can operate productively in a vacuum, in an empty space with the, co the, the supposed infinite resources and no noise. Noise is actually a critical part of our process, mistakes, and, and it's something to think about as our life becomes less friction filled and as the uh, products and the services that we use to anticipate our every need kind of iron out the friction of, of our daily being, mm -hmm. what is that gonna do to the fact that we know creativity is actually spawned from getting lost mm -hmm. or sitting in traffic or dealing with deadlines or limited resources? It's, it's an interesting question that kind of goes in the face of everything we think we want. Do you manufacture constraints on your teams when you work with not just designers, but really anyone? A hundred percent. That's the role of the leader. The, the, one of the roles of the leader is to constantly reiterate and merchandise the mm -hmm. constraints. And when you don't have logical, obvious constraints, find them, seek them, right? And, 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 uh, and merchandise them because they help everyone. And you can always maneuver around them. You can always... There's always an exit plan, an exit strategy, if something's not working, but uh, it, it's, it's empowering to the team to have uh, tangible anchors in the form of constraints. And, 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 and just, just so we're not in the abstract for a second, would a deadline be a constraint? A deadline is a constraint. A, um, a, uh, a obsession on the client's behalf um. that we consider is a constraint. A uh, you know, limitation around the type of content or a direction that seems too con uh, constraining is obviously you know, a constraint in itself. Uh, these are all ways of making us, again, tapping into our inner resourcefulness yeah. and finding a way around it. Yeah, and it's up to the founder or, or the leader too to define why those constraints are important. It it's is. just not just putting it out there like $10,000 one week. The merchandising piece yeah. you know, is so important. And again, we always forget the importance of internal merchandising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the idea generation gap? It's something that we've heard you written on before. What is it and how can a designer know if they're in it? Well, I do believe that, um, that ideas are the culprit in most ideas ever seen in the light of day. Mm. And that's because as creative people, we are addicted to the energy and excitement and frankly the high that accompanies a new idea. It allows us to escape the doldrums of project management. It, the, uh, it allows us to escape our lives and, uh, and all of our self-doubts and all of our daily, daily grind. Uh, um, and, and, and so a new idea is exciting. And, and the, the, the first thing we do when we get into one of those doldrums of project management, you know, one of those periods of time where we're suffering is we just try to come up with another idea. And I like to say that's why there are more half-written novels in the world than there are novels. Yeah. So I think it's important to be optimistic about the future, mm -hmm. but always pessimistic about tasks mm -hmm. and never, never truly satisfied with the progress you're making, always kind of questioning yourself and bringing yourself down to like the pragmatic realization that you're not making enough progress. You have to just hustle more um, the more pain, you know, the more potential glory. You know, these are the types of things I think as creatives we have to, and entrepreneurs, we have to constantly, um, constantly remind ourselves of. And I think that there is this you know, strange, some of the most productive artists I think do bask a little bit in the pain of their process. Mm -hmm. I think that's because they know that that's when it's real. I, 
I, I use a trick when I get all lofty with my ideas. I try and find cynics or people around yeah. me that, that tend to shoot them down, yeah. right? And I befriend, befriend them. I think the, the inclination is to say, I've got an amazing idea and I, wa I want to speak to a kindred spirit, right? Because I really, really want them to love what I... What role do skeptics or, or cynics play in this process? It's an important question because to your point, Creatives like to hire and engage people for their teams that are also like them. You know, that typical, hey, would I like to have a beer with this person? Right. Is why creatives hire creatives and it becomes this intoxicated orgy of idea generation right. and nothing ever gets done. And so you kind of need this sober monitor or, or designated driver um, who is constantly reminding you about the budget and the timeline and the constraints. Um, they're, they're sort of the opposite of the dreamers, mm -hmm. um, which are sort of the Debbie Downers of the world. The people who are constantly saying, wait a second, you know, while the dreamers go to bed at night, super excited about any new idea and introduce to her or his team the next day. On the, on the contrary, the doers are going to bed at night excited when there's nothing new in the pipeline, no new things to interrupt our schedule and take us off track. The healthy, productive, creative team has an extraordinarily strong immune system that is powered by the doers, not the dreamers. Mm. And if you think about the human body, the way we stay healthy is our immune system kills off everything that's new, right? Mm -hmm. And only when we get an organ transplant do we need to suppress the immune system mm -hmm. and empower the, the, the dreamers to take hold and introduce a new organ, something new that actually changes who we are. And so a, a great leader of a productive creative team, and I saw this many times through the course of, of writing Making Ideas Happen and the interviews with these teams I would meet, a great leader is constantly, first of all, hiring a lot of doers, not just dreamers, empowering the doers 99% of the time, mm -hmm. but then making sure that the chemistry allows the doers to take a back seat and the dreamers to take hold when there's something new, a new problem to be solved, a new brief to be considered. You know, That's when you empower the creatives, the dreamers. That's powerful. Um, you've invested in companies like Pinterest, Uber, Warby Parker, um, and these are really strong brands that people look to as design leaders as well, right? Um, in your investments, like, have you seen any patterns amongst these companies as far as how they approach and deploy design? Well, each one of those companies was either co-founded by a designer or um, had leaders that really, really value design decisions and talent at the very start of their companies. None of them outsource design at any point in time, which is actually interesting because most companies, at least in the beginning, do outsource design. Mm -hmm. And when you outsource something, what you're basically saying is it is definitely not your competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. What you do is you outsource things that you just need, like tables, like sort of stuff that needs to get done but is not really core to what's gonna make you stand out. And so uh, I, I look for teams that don't outsource their competitive advantage, which is, I think, a logical thing to look for as an investor. And if I think that design is a real core part of, of what they will be building and how they'll succeed and stand out, you know, that, that's, that's a starting point. Yeah. Um, I also think that the, uh, the openness to feedback around product and design decisions, the value, even like Warby Parker, you know, Neil really would put a stamp on anything that would go out that represented the brand of that company. Um, and as he's scaled his business, he's had to scale the ability to make sure that everything is consistent on brand, on point. And design is a huge part of the consistency of the user experience of Warby Parker. Whether it's the shipment of your glasses or the store that you go into or the website you deliver, you, you visit, um, or, the, um, or the emails that you get. Mm. You know, the design is just a constant thread. And, uh, and there's internal operations to support that. You know, contrast that to other companies that I won't name that I've worked at before where you have different departments making different decisions. Mm -hmm. And if you're a product manager, you have no say over what the email looks like sure. that goes to your customers. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Um, okay, so interesting. Now, outsourcing, implying that you're maybe using a freelancer or an agency of some sort, right? Um, you built a platform for freelancers agency designers, client site designers, all of them to kind of celebrate the work that they do. I'm curious if you see freelancers and agency designers and, 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 and people that actually work on the client side as standing in stark contrast to each other. Yeah. And what can they learn from each other? Well, it's, an, it's a great question because I actually have seen many examples of hiring a great freelancer mm. and bringing them essentially in-house. 
as an extended part of the team working directly with you. And to me, that is less outsourcing than going to an agency right. where they're basically managing you through an account manager mm -hmm. and they're hiding in some ways their process and they're hiding actually who's doing the work. Yeah. So I've seen many examples where companies will embrace a particular freelancer for something extremely important. Yeah. Because oftentimes, as you guys know, some of the greatest, greatest creative talents in the world don't work for anyone but themselves because they can. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that means you're essentially outsourcing it. Um, they actually partner deeply with brands and companies. Agencies, on the other hand, I believe, uh, and maybe somewhat controversially, are a uh, are a you know a vestige from the past. You know, this is a, they are coming from a time where you didn't know who to go to to get something done, where you didn't have the tools to manage creative talent on their own terms or where they want to work. And the idea of working with creatives was like, Ugh, like you know, I'm gonna let someone else do that because yeah. I'm a company. Yeah. And, uh, and they're from a time where design wasn't the competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I just think, and it's and where there was an old boy network of yeah. people who would place ads and come up with ideas and execute them. I, I think that that time is beyond, behind us. Mm -hmm. I think some of the greatest most innovative agencies today are actually just building rosters of freelancers that they have relationships with on platforms like Behance. And I met many of these companies. Mm -hmm. And then they basically just have a outbound Salesforce slash account management effort to build new business. So their, their role in all this now is that they own the relationship? Yep, they're, they're building the client relationship and then they are not bringing creatives in house because they know that that's sort of an old thing. Right. They're engaging creatives on their own terms right. and they're serving as a conduit, which is the step towards eventually them not even existing at all. Exactly. And companies being able to find talent directly, yeah. build relationships. And by the way, how great is that for the talent? Yeah. The talent basically gets paid more. Mm -hmm. The Client pays less because mm -hmm. the middleman is cut out essentially, and the relationship that's spawned between the creative talent and the company or brand yields a better output. Yeah. Um, are there any roles or responsibilities that you feel designers are not looking to or not building that might be costing them influence and credibility at these companies? Well, I think that uh, I think that with all that we're talking about here all this new opportunity that designers have to work directly with clients and to um, really be the competitive advantage of all these different types of businesses across industries, with all that opportunity comes responsibility. Uh, what, is that res what is that responsibility? It means becoming a better manager. It means being able to manage up and influence without authority, which is an entirely different skill set. They don't teach you this stuff in design school, right? I mean, this is, um, this is stuff you have to learn through on your own. A lot of it's through experience, a lot of it's through reading books and understanding and attending conferences and, and considering that a big part of your education is not just design and skills, now it's, you know, now it's also management skills and, and, um, and, 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 and getting yourself on that learning curve. So I think that's a big part of it. I also think that being able to make sure you can provide for yourself, yeah simple things like asking for more money, mm -hmm. um, knowing what you're worth, holding your clients accountable, being able to fire clients when you feel like they are sapping your energy and your soul, and, um, and recognizing that that short-term sacrifice will yield long-term gain. I think that these are all sorts of parts of that responsibility set that we have to take on. Um, I, I want to go back for a quick second, back to the agency world, because there are tens, probably tens of thousands of agency designers listening to this, I hope. Yep. <laughs> um, I want to give them a snowball's chance here for a second. Um, or not, a, I want to give them a real chance. What are, what should agencies, other than building lines of contact and relationships with freelancers, the best freelancers in the world. What else can agencies do to redeem themselves yeah. uh, and not be mired by the legacy of what agencies were? I have, it's a great question because I've worked with some amazing agencies yeah. um, and, uh, and what these agencies can do, I think in, at their best, yeah. is be the non-drunk participant right. in the process of bringing an idea to fruition, uh, bringing a different perspective, 
for companies that are not thinking enough about brand because it's not in the DNA of their founders or enough about design, uh, the great agencies become a thought partner and have a seat at the table. Yeah. The agencies that I've worked with that I recommend and, uh, and, and want to work with again and again insisted on having a seat at the table, brought the actual talent into the process rather than trying to almost keep the talent secret and mm -hmm. present the, you know, the business mm -hmm. contact as the, the person that you should interact with. Um, the best agencies that I've worked with are willing to give attribution to the people who actually did the work mm -hmm. because they are confident enough that they're adding enough value into the equation with the ideas and with the process improvements yeah. that they, um, they're, not, they're not afraid of admitting that someone's doing the work, which yeah. seems crazy, but is actually you know, too commonplace. So, um, and, and, and really, you also invest. You know, great agencies are willing to work with a brand that's a little off. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think of agencies like Red Antler in New York that takes a group of um, guys like the founders of Casper, mm -hmm. you know, the mattress company, and says, you know, this is all going to be about your brand and builds this long term partnership mm -hmm. to bring the Casper brand to life and to so many people, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think would have happened without Red Antler, from what I know. Right. And there are a lot of examples like that. So uh, that's the modern age agency. I think it's oftentimes an agency founded by creative talent yeah. and, um, and really run um, in a way that. Uh, you know, is, is thinking about the modern day client needs. Yeah. yeah. You spoke about one of the skills that designers need to um, develop is managing and uh, I'm assuming presenting as well, right? Yeah. Um, so assume you're a designer at a company and you're about to present a project to the CEO or a non-designer executive, right? Um, how should that designer start the discussion? Yeah. Uh, what are the things that they should actually focus on in that discussion? And how do they actually keep the person's attention? Which yeah. I see is probably one of the biggest issues. Listen, a mock-up is greater than, has more power than hours of discussion and debate. And I have been in so many meetings where there's just this debate and back and forth and memos being read and distributed yeah. and everything else. And then someone just says, let's just look at it. Mm -hmm. And if the designer's in the room, great. If they're not, like, shame on you, bring them in mm -hmm. and show some mock-ups. And suddenly, within minutes, everyone's aligned yeah. as to what should be done next. Designers need to assert themselves to make that happen more quickly. Sadly, still to this day, it's either the product manager or the business unit leader or the CEO or you know, someone else who has to advocate for the designer to have a voice in that conversation and has to make it so that the mock-ups end up leading rather than following. Yes. Designers need to take, that's part of the responsibility, you know, taking the responsibility of making sure that design leads. Yeah. The structure in companies either gets in the way of this or supports it. I've always insisted on having designers report directly to me. Mm. And I remember when I took over as this VP of product role at Adobe, mm. where there was actually a design firm basically in the company, like a union, if, like a separate division, if you will. Mm. I insisted on having a series of designers report to me on the things that I was leading. That was very controversial, and rightly so, because designers who were amazing, amazing talented designers in the company were saying, you know, why, you know, why are there now designers embedded in product and business? Mm -hmm. Like, what does that mean for us? as this like ex internal agency. I think you have to position designers though to have the influence to be able to assert themselves and to lead the discussion when you're trying to solve something as a business. So there's a lot of structural work that needs to be done to make this happen you know, more broadly throughout business and, 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 and other industries um, in business. So, uh, but designers play a critical role and at best should, should push for that. And, and in this example where you asked for design to report directly to you, how were they structured beforehand? Like, were they reporting to anyone? Like, what did that look like? Designers reported up into, and this is many companies, right? And most, even startup companies, there is a person who leads design. Designers report up to him or her. Then there are product managers and people running the business units. And designers are then staffed on these projects. Mm -hmm. But their, their, their um, compensation and their performance is actually still reviewed and determined by the person who leads design. And so that's like a break right there. Like, wh what do you mean? Like the designer is so critical to the business and the product yet isn't able to be compensated by the person who's running the business or the product. Mm. It doesn't make any sense. 
And then like, why would they feel like they can have their one-on-ones and get management advice and be able to assert themselves if they're working alongside people, but not people that they actually work for mm. or with. Yeah. And so it's, um, it's just a, it's a, you know, some cult- cultures and chemistries can still overcome this with the relationships, yeah. but why not structure it to succeed in the first place? Yeah. So I, those are the types of things you have to think about. And coming, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Go ahead. And coming back to this meeting, this presentation, right? Um, I've seen examples where the designer gets to lead this meeting and they go, they present, they not even present, they just put up a mock, Mm -hmm. right? And then everyone just jumps on that mock. And what ends up happening is the feedback or the discussions that happen is not actually relevant at all to the discussion, right? Um, So what context should the designer be providing when they put that thing up on the screen to drive the conversation? This is an art and it's so important. It's a great question. It starts with asking you have to you have to lead the conversation you don't just put up a mock and and then sit back and let the firing squad begin right Mm -hmm. you put up a mock and you say this is a concept what questions do you have and and this is the problem that you asked us to solve like the reason this mock exists is to solve the problem the following problems now start peppering me with questions and then you help people understand it and, um, and then when people start to say things like make the logo bigger, you know, or maybe make this blue, or maybe a great designer asks the people to then rephrase it as problems they think still exist. Mm-hmm. I actually am worried that people are not going to know how to buy. Oh, well, how do you say that? It's not clear to me, like, how you actually go, where is the action? Or, you know, or what's the default? Uh, I want to make sure that 90% of people actually do X. Those are the types of responses, that's the feedback you should be getting. Not design direction, you should be getting problems that still exist because the designer's role is to solve problems. And if your audience still has those problems, you haven't succeeded yet. Um, I wanna first of all apologize to our listeners and viewers about all the noise. There's not a single corner of New York where you don't hear some sort of street noise and it's a little echoey, so we apologize for that. When we come back, Scott, I wanna ask you a personal question. So we'll be right back, stay tuned. Thanks again to Squarespace for supporting the show. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to get a domain, create a website, or build an online store. They have beautiful, award-winning designer templates and 24-7 customer service. Our project, High Resolution, is on Squarespace. We chose it because it just made sense. We had a lot of research, writing, preparation for our interviews and traveling to do. We just didn't have the time to waste figuring out how to style or build our site. So we just hopped on Squarespace, checked out their templates, and picked the one that worked for our brand and our style. We were done in less than a day. So if you've been thinking about starting your own website or even online store, start your free trial today at squarespace.com and use the offer code HIGHRESOLUTION, that's one word, to get 10% off your first purchase. Make your next move with Squarespace. We'd also like to thank our friends at Envision for their support. Envision is the world's leading product design platform powering the future of digital design through their understanding of the importance of collaboration. They're used by some of the most innovative companies in the world, like Facebook, Capital One, Netflix, and Airbnb. I work with remote teams all the time, and I found that keeping a healthy dialogue is really important. Without it, building strong work relationships gets a lot harder, and that leads to poor collaboration. I've also found that prototypes are a great way for me to show my full vision for a design, and this helps cut down a lot of back and forth. Envision makes all of this really easy. You can rapidly prototype your designs and collaborate across every stage of your project, taking your ideas from concept to code. It simplifies virtually every aspect of the design workflow and makes collaboration a core part of the process for everyone, from project managers to designers, developers, and writers. Teams that build digital products are at a serious advantage when they use Envision's suite of prototyping and collaboration tools. It's the best way to get everyone on board. Visit envisionapp.com high resolution for three months free. Do you have any mentors? I do have mentors. Um, I I feel like I have, rather than one key mentor, I have different mentors for different things. Mm. And these are people who I have gone back to at certain times or have helped me at pivotal moments. Um, And... uh, I think it's dangerous to have one person you feel you want to look up to and emulate because you don't want to play someone else's playbook. Yeah. At the same time, I've made the mistake of insulating myself too much. And um, as an introvert, it's kind of my nature. And I always felt like, well, it's my own journey. Mm. No one else is going to be able to help me. And, 
And at times I've been humbled by the fact that as soon as I force myself to ask somebody, like, what would you do? I just totally realized that I was reinventing the wheel or that there is a logical answer. So I push myself to go and visit these mentors occasionally. And, um, and sometimes I'm finding, especially these days, it's not a particular answer I'll get. It's more just the conversation. You know, some of the best discussions don't have an answer. They're just a way of unwinding thought. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of someone who doesn't have the cachet of Scott Belsky. Okay? Because <laughs> at one point you That's didn't. That's easy. Yeah. Well, at, at one point you didn't, right? Right. Um, there's quite a, there's, there's an intimidation factor, right? You look up to someone and you want to find them, you want to seek them. You don't want to impose too much, but you, yeah. you, you want to ask them for help. Uh, what's the right way to go about finding a mentor? And then I'd like to, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, how do you keep that relationship kindled? I think it's important to remind yourself that everyone's super busy and has preoccupations yeah. and um, you know, and someone that seems like they've made it and they would be a great mentor probably has a whole other suite of things that they're now worried about and up at night thinking about and whatever else. And, uh, and so you, and mentorship comes out of relationships. So when you just reach out to someone and say, I want a coffee, it's, you know, it's basically saying, I want you to blindly give me your time. Yeah. And, um, and it's, I don't know, like I always am torn about it because on the one hand I, I like giving back, but I also, how much time do I actually have? And I also feel like my responsibility is to use my time towards the things I can make the most impact in. And oftentimes those are talking to larger groups or working on projects that I think need to see the light of day and uh, not filling my day up with coffees with people I don't know. So I'm, I'm torn, you know, mm. it's, a, it's a good question. I think that it starts with making it both ways, um, actually, one of my uh, one of my kind of mentors who I most recently met uh, or, or visit, went to visit, he was saying to me that you know because I was thanking him for his time and he was like no 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 like this is exactly what I'm going through too, mm -hmm. but at a different level of my life and so there was this parallel that I felt in some ways he was saying this is why I'm giving you the time because actually he needed it. I'm going yeah I need it too yeah. is what he was telling me and so it's great to find people like that. And, um, and there have been people that have reached out to me, you know, that have sort of said, you know, I'm going through a career transition right now, um, debating this, you know, investor versus operator versus founder versus CEO. And, and I'm thinking, oh, like, I actually think about that as well. Like, I'm always, all, I'm kind of tearing there as well. And I want a conversation around that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think you want, like all relationships, to be, especially in business, to be mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. And I think you want to pose that. Um, and also just asking a question, like sometimes someone will ask me, send a random email and I don't even know the person, but they'll pose like a specific question, mm -hmm. like two or three sentences of where they're at right now and then a specific question and I'll just answer it. Nice. So and that's can, not a formalized mentor mentee yeah. relationship. Yeah. They're not asking for an hour of my time, but they're saying like, listen, like if you were deciding between this job and just this job, like Scott, what would you, what kind of questions would you be thinking about? Right. And I'll say like, this is what I would be doing. And if it's helpful, great. Took me five minutes in a, in, a, in a taxi or an Uber, you know? <laughs> Do you think there are more examples um, of when someone who thinks they need a mentor is really just needing to do this, just ask a direct question? You know, I think that, um, I think that, I think that just getting a question, asking a question and getting different data points is important. Yeah. But I also have to say that a lot of the best lessons are learned the hard way. And I do think that we get paralyzed too often by thinking we need someone else's advice or help, when in truth, we just need to do the work. And we just need to try, we just need to throw ourselves into something and recognize that somehow, some way, a labor of love always pays off, just not how you expect. And I, I, I'm, I'm amazed by how true that is. I have seen so many people take jobs because they paid five or ten thousand dollars more, mm. or jobs because they said, "Well, I need to do this for a few years in order to do this later on," and then they get stuck and they become middle managers or unhappy, right? And then the opportunity cost just gets higher over time of switching and trying something new. I have never seen a situation where someone who was doing something because they truly love it ended up just like totally as a failure. It just always leads to something. And they may start in doing something and they may make no money for a while, but they just like 
sort of end up somewhere else or having a chance circumstantial conversation with someone else that then leads them to another great role. Something always kind of pans out. It's this weird kind of nature of humanity and evolution, I guess, is that you're just, if you keep on this path towards, you know, warmer, 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 mm. um, you get somewhere. And so that means that stop sort of trying to plan and get more advice before making a decision. Mm -hmm. Just make an incremental step towards something that's interesting to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it will pan out. Do you believe in building on your strengths or trying to make yourself whole by focusing on areas that you need more help on? Yeah. Um, well, here's the way I would answer the, this question is that uh, what we're all trying to do in our careers as freelancers or entrepreneurs or leaders of big companies is survive the messy middle of big, bold projects. Yeah. And the messy middle to me is just two things. It's endurance and it's optimization. It's this volatile kind of way up, right? And, and uh, it's definitely not linear, right? It's always, you have this great idea. Oh shit, this is really hard to execute. Okay, like I'm gonna make progress. Well, it's not linear. It's actually very volatile, full of these downs, these lows, which you have to endure and these highs, which you have to optimize. And the highs are when something for some reason works. And it could be in the way you're bringing people onto your team, you're optimizing your team, it could be the way you're optimizing your own way of working, and more often than not, it's the way your product is working or not working. So to answer your question, I think it's all about optimizing the little things that seem to be working, which are your strengths. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're just circumstantial things that happen to work that surprise you, um, or little things that are getting traction. You're a designer and you throw up all this stuff in your portfolio, no one ever cares, and then suddenly one project goes viral, mm -hmm. you know, and you're like, oh, maybe I should be doing more of this and right. less of this. I really think that that's how greatness you know, becomes even greater, is when you start to optimize and emphasize the things that people are paying attention to and that are working and naturally de-emphasize the things that aren't. Yeah. I don't think it's about obsessing over fixing things that are broken, mm -hmm. which is contrary to logic that you should always fix things that are broken and don't yeah. fix things that aren't, that aren't broken. Mm -hmm. um, so endurance in those lows, you know, optimizing the things that work in both how you work as well as how your product is performing. You once gave a talk about the importance of deciding what you're willing to be bad at yeah. when you're working on a product, right? First, can you just explain that philosophy? And second, do you think this is a tool that designers can use to help focus their careers? Well, what I mean by deciding what you're willing to be bad at yeah. is facing, first of all, the fact that if you try to be good at everything, you're not gonna be good at any one thing better than everyone else, right? And, uh, and, and that's how an individual or a brand really stands out and has a competitive advantage in an industry, which is ultimately we're all grappling towards. We all want a competitive advantage in something, whether it's typography or illustration or infographics or whether it's you know being the best airline or being the best whatever. And so in the process of doing that, what you need to look at is the kind of factors that distinguish you in your industry. What are they? Is it you're cheap, right? Is it price? Is it availability? Like you're the one that's always just available and people call you when they need someone last minute? Mm. Is it you're especially good at infographics and you're like just so good at design that kind of comes from math? Yeah. Mm. Is it that you're like such a good concept artist or that you're like so clever and you always find that like little thing you put in that everyone kind of, you know, kind of engages with on a personal level? Yeah. Like find your thing, but what you shouldn't be trying to do is be the cheapest and the most available and the best at this and the best at that and the best at that. And so when you look at that X axis, right? And you're like, okay, I wanna be, I don't wanna be known for price. I'm gonna be expensive. And that's just the way I feel I'm gonna be, right? Um, I'm not competing on 99 designs or something like that. Like I want, I'm going for quality. Uh, and uh, you know, and I don't want to be known for Maybe I don't want to be known for typography work. Um, I want to be known for these, you know, these quick illustration type of work that can be done quickly or whatever it is for you. And then when you make that decision, that affects everything. It affects how you market yourself. It affects the types of projects you say yes to and no to. And you start to have like these standards that you project through your portfolio, through the content you write, through what you stand for. And you just have to find those things to distinguish you. And I think that's so important. And it's easy to say, but it's hard to do because when we're in the thick of it, 
in our careers or in leading our businesses, we're liable to just take every opportunity we can get. We're liable to say, yes, we're good at everything. We're trying to be the best at price and availability and this and that. And in truth, what you really end up standing out uh, through is is finding out what you're willing to be bad at. And are you are you deciding this at the beginning of your career? Like, you know, the, the thing that many designers are taught when they come out of design school or even just college or high school, really, um, is to try everything, figure yeah. out, you know, what you do like and then focus your attention on the things that you do like. Or is this a self-assessment that you're doing from day one? I don't think you should decide right at the beginning of your career because you have to figure it out. I mean, you have to figure out what your strengths are, what you're being known for. It's kind of back to that optimizing question of, like, what's working? What are people... Are, are, are all my clients saying, I love working with you because you're always available to do these last minute things? Or are people saying to you, that cover you made for us is just like, is winning awards for that story. And like, oh my gosh, you're so good at these, you know, taking like a, almost like a, a moment in time and capturing it visually. Or, or are they saying to you, these long baked projects, like creating a new typeface or something. Like, I just love working with you in that capacity. And your, the, the rigor you have in staying engaged with the project for a year is amazing. Like you hear that in the beginning of your career and as your career progresses, but then you have to decide, like what am I gonna be known for? And if you don't stop and make that decision, you will never be known for anything. I have a question around the design community landscape. Um, years ago when you started Behance, you, know, you were solving a problem for the design community and that problem was attribution and uh, a place to be discovered, yeah. right? Um, since then, the design landscape has changed a lot, right? There are a lot of things that have remained the same, but there are a lot of new things that did not exist five, 10 years ago, right? So I'm really curious, if you were to start Behance again today, uh, what would that look like? Like, what would you be trying to solve? What would you be going after? Well, the, the, big, the big holy grail problem that I always wanted to solve with Behance, um, but didn't, and, have, and we haven't yet as, a, you know, as the extended Behance team and family, is um, is around a better way of matching talent with opportunity that um, that sort of transcends the traditional circumstantial ways that people get matched up. I don't think the answer is cert the cer certainly the answer is not crowdsourcing. I think that that hurts more than helps. Um, I don't think that these commoditizing marketplaces for design are good. Um, I think that actually there's pricing power for the designer when he or she is matched with the perfect opportunity. But how do you make it clear that that's the perfect person for you as a brand to work with? How do you match the two of you? And how do you make sure that great t content, first of all, rises to the top? And it's not always the same usual suspects that are trending at the top of a search. Um, and, then, uh, and then how do you make two people work together in a superior way over time? With with high you know with a high price point, mm -hmm. and I think that that's there's so many like O desk O desk type Upwork you know whatever things in the world that help people match and it, but it's still all about like price and availability and it's not about this high quality creative relationship between a client and a brand. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem that I find still very interesting and I think still is ahead ahead of Behance and Adobe potentially or other companies out there. So I know we're, we're running short on time. You have to leave soon. We've got a couple of community questions that we want to get to. Sure. Um, and these could be rapid fire. Right? Right. Um, how should designers explain the role of design to people in their business? I think that designers should always ground design as the, as the discipline of problem solving, right? And um, so it's as well as, again, those little things that make a big difference. Mm -hmm. I think that it's also important for designers to help their clients internally or externally, right? Understand that, um, that their solutions are, are coming from years and years of experience and mm -hmm. exposure and portfolios that they looked at and critiqued and everything. I mean, one of my favorite stories about the whole kind of Paul Rand, Steve Jobs relationship was when they negotiated on the rate for so long and then like, right, Paul <laughs> Rand just sort of immediately scribbles this thing and gives Steve this thing and he's like, what the, are you kidding me? I, I'm paying you this like six yeah. figure sum and for like two minutes of work and he's like, no, for like 30 years of work. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, but there's part of the education curve that designers have to uh, do with their clients, help them understand where the solution is even coming from. So making sure that your discipline is regarded as one of problem solving making sure that clients understand that sometimes the little things actually make the biggest difference. Yeah. 
helping your clients understand that it's an end-to-end -end experience that's being designed is not just the splash page or some yeah. part of the product. Those are things that you need to push. The second question, when you're the only designer at a company, at a business, um, what are the things that you can do to convince leadership of its value? Well, I think that showing, not telling, you know, speaks volumes, right? Uh, when, um, but at the end, there's also the aspect of merchandising what just happened. When you show something that halts the argument and suddenly brings it to another level. Sometimes you can actually introduce a mock-up into a debate and actually expedite the decision and help get people aligned much more quickly. And no one even knows that it was the design and the designer that that success should be attributed to. Mm -hmm. And so it's important as the designer in that circumstance to, you know, to bring that um, to the leader's attention. And this is why, you know, just taking a step back, I feel very lucky to have had this design background from college. You know, I took all these design classes, then I went into business, and then I built this new design community and really jumped into being a product designer, basically, with my team. And also had a background in leadership development. So I'm always kind of, this is a weird mix. And the thing I'm always taking out of it is that designers are not considering themselves leaders in a team. They're not being powered as leaders in teams. And the companies that actually believe that design is a competitive advantage um, and empower designers to have that seat at the table and lead um, and be structured internally and compensated internally in the right way are the ones that you know, have that competitive advantage come through in the marketplace. So we can end with this last question. Yep. As the function of design continues to evolve, what are some roles and methodologies that you think will emerge over the next five years? Well, I think that, the, um, I think that design is starting to become a competitive advantage on the enterprise tool side of things. Uh. I think that uh, it's been such a consumer product focus, and actually it's funny, in the investor landscape, yeah. people still consider themselves either a consumer product investor or an enterprise product investor. Yeah. And you know what? At the end of the day, they're people using the products. And when you're making the investment, you need the same lens mm -hmm. around the product sensibility and how the team is structured and our designers empowered to make a difference and all these different things. Yeah. Sure, the business model and the go-to-market may be different yeah. um, and the pricing and things like that, but but the products themselves need to be borne by the same principles. Now, how do you get designers all jazzed up to work in a company that builds enterprise tools? Yeah. You know, is another challenge. But I think that, uh, but I think it make, it's gonna make a big difference. I think we're gonna see more of that. I think that the, uh, the interface is the place where a lot of industries are finally becoming competitive and being determined in terms of who wins. And it's sort of like that slap a hand game yeah. where you know a great product is building an interface for the technology that they built and then another product is building an interface that just basically uses the APIs of that product right. and then another product is like an audible version of the, you know a visual or a, or an audio UI and then yeah. and it's like it's an interface game but guess what that's all designers yeah. right designers own the interface yeah. and the future is going to be determined by interfaces by screens in our homes by audible cues by you know all of these sort of AI-supported, um, frictionless interfaces. It's exciting. It's an exciting time to be a designer and to be thinking about industries and problems that just need to be rethought. That's a good place to end. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me. Hey, you made it to the end. Congratulations. Thanks for watching the episode. I really, really hope you liked it. If you did like it, please leave us a review on the iTunes store. And by the way, if you have any questions that came up because of the content that, that we covered, with our guests, go on YouTube, go on Twitter. You can tweet us, you can leave us a comment. We'll get back to you, we'll help you as much as possible. At High Res Podcast, that's the, the screen name or the handle for Twitter, for Instagram, for Facebook. Find us, talk to us, we wanna converse with you. Uh, we're not gonna leave here, by the way, without also thanking our friends at Searle Video. They've been an amazing partner on this entire project. So Searle Video is a creative studio based out of Portland, Oregon. They've helped creative communities tell stories for over 10 years. They've done advertisements, behind the scene footage, um, and documentaries for companies like Google, Slack, XOXO Festival, Adobe, Intel. They're incredible. They've traveled with us through the entire country documenting these stories with our guests. 
That's incredible. Thank you so much, Searle. Listen, if you're a startup looking to elevate your product, if you're a big company looking to humanize your brand, if you're someone in the creative community who just wants to tell a story, you've got to check out the team at Searle Video. It's searlevideo.com, S-E-A-R-L-E, video.com. Check out our friends at Searle. Thank you so much, guys. You guys have been incredible on this project.